The problem is you have people that, other people that acknowledge what it is and then they start giving you, well, we're gonna stretch the psoas muscle and because everyone's into flexibility, whether it's you, your Pilates teacher or your yoga teacher, or just general, you know, your chiropractor says your psoas is tight, you need to stretch it. It's, well, I don't know if stretching muscles is all that great, but okay, go ahead and do this anyway because <laughs> you'll be a better athlete or you'll feel better when you can hit that pose. You know, it's funny, as an aside, these people that do all these poses and Pilates and stuff like that, they're a mess. Yes, also. You put them on a table and do RPR, they're, everything is off. You know, they always have pains and things like that. Well, yeah, if you pull your body into that shape, which it's not supposed to be, something's not going to go well. So this is what it actually does. It has three heads, which we're going to look at. It, is, it attaches from your spine and your thoracic region to your hip flexors. So how much it actually moves, like does it shorten and does it lengthen, nobody really knows. It's just they apply, the, they look through everything through the lens of is the muscle flexible or all that. But you can see it's got three heads and they're missing one head here which is really interesting because it does actually roll around and connect to your xiphoid process. So not only does it lengthen those two front and back but it's a 3D muscle and it rolls up around to the front as well in a very fascial manner. Again a 3D image of where it goes and what it does. And you can see that it does wrap around through it inserts way down deep into your thigh. So if you're going to do level three RPR, it's hard to reach that point. It's not gonna happen. But you can certainly get it from its spinal origins. Again, I don't know why this is a great psoas stretch. Nothing about that has anything to do with the psoas. It's just a lady laying down and someone is selling a foam and someone is selling a strap and you can go ahead and again like this as well I don't know if that's actually stretching anything maybe your quad and people say well it's a hip flexor it is a hip flexor but what I think you have to understand about it is the fact that it initiates the movement it's the first thing that contracts to get it rolling I think this is probably the best way of looking at it someone called it a cobra muscle but I do like the idea that it shows how it creates this very strong structure as it does look like a cobra. So this is actually your diaphragmatic head of your psoas muscle. So you can see how it rolls up around and comes through and it sits on top of your diaphragm. So when you talk about breathing in your psoas initiation or your psoas movement, that's actually what is happening because there is a head, a branch of that lumbar head that actually sits on top there. So when you talk about why does yelling and shouting have anything to do with when you're doing RPR, you know, you're contracting your diaphragm which sits and shares the same innervation with that psoas and just that movement or that vibration takes place can make that psoas fire. So if you're doing hardcore, old-fashioned, be activated, you know, RPR, you're really hardcore into it. There's an element of yelling that goes along with it, like a diaphragmatic yell. And if you think about the, the all blacks when they do their thing where they get out and yell and scream, what are they doing? They've got themselves in a rotated position in their stance, which is your psoas, and then they start yelling and screaming, and you're starting to innervate or fire that lumbar head of your, your, diaphragm, of your psoas with your diaphragm. I'm not saying they know that that's what's going on, but probably that is what's going on. Then you start looking at the fascial chains, the anatomy train stuff, and you'll see that the psoas is very important in most of the anatomy trains. There's one version. So here's the research, and there's lots of it. I just cherry-picked recent stuff. So they did men and women sprinters. And they all talk about how significantly bigger the psoas major was. And then it goes, 
again. Different group of Japanese guys. Not in the thighs, but it's all in the psoas. And why the rec fem? You guys know the rec rectoris femoris, right? That's that triangle guy going down with the middle, right? It's a hip flexor. So the psoas is working with the hip flexors, because it's part of it. It's the initiator of that movement. More. It's bigger, it's bigger, it's bigger. It does more. Whether you're starting or sprinting or just standing there, it's bigger. This one kind of does glutes to acknowledge the fact that, yes, glutes are bigger in elite athletes than sub-elite, which are quite a bit bigger than your average people. But again, now they're finding out this is 2021. There's two papers in 2022 that talked about in acceleration how the glute is a stabilizer and not a thruster, which is interesting. And it eats even with the curves. So someone who's got a bigger right psoas muscle is a better curve runner. But since we all run curves, do we do anything that we all turn, right? Are we putting ourselves in a position where the psoas, we can get the psoas to fire when our body is leaned over a little bit? It's an interesting thing. So again, here's psoas muscles with distance runners. So basically up and down, it's all the same research. I think I came up with 22 papers since 1982 that all talk about how important the psoas muscle is. But what do we do for it? Well, we can do RPR for it and reset it and stuff like that and hope that it's doing it, but Maybe we can do more. So what it actually looks like in movement, if you are going to test it. So for the diaphragmatic psoas, which is the one that acts like the cobra and comes up, down, and through, we're looking for tests where it can be the only guy moving. It's the only muscle that can do the work. And there it is. It's not a great picture. That's my son. My son has the body of a, an RPR kid. He started doing RP. Let me rephrase that. I did RPR on him when he was a little kid. And he didn't know, you know, you kind of rest around, you hit the spots, and I did it to him pretty frequently. And as he grew, he looked like that kid where he has a really big butt, really thick through his belly, and then everything else just kind of gets skinnier as he goes away, and he does have these feet that look like some kind of catapults. Unfortunately for him, he played volleyball. That was his sport of choice because it was the only sport I knew absolutely nothing about, and I couldn't tell him to do anything. Both of my children picked volleyball because I knew nothing about it, and I couldn't help them anyway. That way, they wouldn't have to come down and train. My son, son can jump out of the gym. I mean, he's got a 38-inch vertical jump. And we, he, I, we worked out three times in his life. We worked out three times together. That was it. That was just him. And I think that's because I kind of set him up that way. Going up, you have a thoracic psoas, which now, by the way, first one is 30, degree, 30 degrees out and 10 degrees up. That is your lumbar psoas. I'm sorry, diaphragmatic psoas. You raise it up 30 degrees, and now you are looking at your thoracic psoas. And then your lumbar one is up 45 degrees. Go back to old-fashioned leg lifts. We've been doing this. So when we started out, by the way, he's got his hands on the wall. So he can stabilize his torso because what you'll find is once you lose that rib cage, you can't engage that psoas anymore. So people who have like, well, I do RPR and I still have this kid with a hamstring problem. Probably nine out of 10 times is they've lost the ability to control the edge of that rib cage. To me, the more I've been doing this and I've been doing this 33 years professionally and I've been studying it forever in a little nerdy sense when I was younger than that, you know, I've looked at everything, and the more and more I look into it, the more and more it comes back to, can you control the edge of that rib cage? You know, I, get free, I get NFL athletes that come by. I, get, I have freak kids that come by and not so freak people, and people that are really good but break. 
The ones who don't break, they always have control of the edge of that rib cage in three planes. And I'll look, we'll look at the three planes here in a second. So I want to make sure that you stabilize that, and you do that, you can press into the wall, which means I can use that to tuck that rib cage. Cal Dietz calls it the thoracic tuck. He's into naming everything these days, because he's, he's tired of everyone stealing his stuff, so he names it and puts a date on it. But if I can anchor that rib cage and then engage the psoas muscle, it's just an old-fashioned leg lift. And we'll start isometrically. I mean, can you hold your own body weight? And what you're going to find is some people can't, because when they lift up, that whole hip is going to come off the floor. Their psoas isn't strong enough to lift that leg. Therefore, they're not going to be able to engage it. So how do we strengthen it? Well, have someone hold down that end while he's anchored, and just have him learn to lift it. And when you feel the lift, you are going to feel it here. So my coaching cue is pretend like there's a handle at the top, the bottom of your rib cage, and when you lift that leg, someone's pulling that handle to lift that leg up. If you do it wrong, you will feel it in your thighs. It's compensating. It's creating a compensation pattern. Here's where it gets weird, is kids that we couldn't engage, I'll go in, I'll either use my finger, a Theragun, or a light or something, and I'll hit their psoas spot, and all of a sudden they get it. That's where the weird RPR stuff is like, holy shit, it really, really, really works. I just hit this, and all of a sudden they can pick it up again. And we'll go six inches, and we'll do 12 inches, and we'll do 18 inches, just like back in peewee football days. Remember you used to cheat and put your hands underneath your back or put your hands underneath your butt and try and hold up your butt? So when you get good at it and you can control your pelvis and your rib cage and lift that leg, then we're going to do it isometrically, which is someone's going to come, block, and push down. Then, three weeks of that, if we're doing triphasic, then I'm going to start at 45 and someone's going to shove it down forcefully and you've got to hold. When you feel it dump into your quad, it's too much or I need a break. You'll find when you start, you may be good for two reps before you stop, before you start to feel it in your hip flexor, and it jams up. And here's the crazy thing. So I started with these guys this summer, and all we worked on was feet and psoas. It was kind of like my little experiment. That's it. And we pulled, we pulled on a sled. So when they went to run, this kid here, his peak velocity on a 1080 with one kilo resistance is 10.4 meters a second. So what, did, what was he running before that? Uh, his peak velocity, uh, he was, last year his best time was a 9.8. And he peaked out about 9.8 meters a second, 9.9 9 meters a second. So that's that much faster. And all we do is feet and so is. I've got other kids that, did, that we've done the same thing where you had these considerable time drops. So all we're doing is psoas and feet. I think he ran 21.5 last year in the summertime, which is pretty good. After we started doing this, his best time, he was third in state. He was a 22.2 kid, which in Illinois, with our shit weather, that's a good time. And then he dropped down. To, all we did, psoas and feet. And all of a sudden, he ran 21.5.